this is the explanation for the fourth EKG of the EKG club. The purpose of this question is to identify a narrow complex tachycardia that is regular with identifiable discrete P waves in front of every QRS complex. Every P wave is followed by a QRS complex and every QRS complex is preceded by a P wave. Here are the answers to the question. We're going to go over some of these in the next few slides. In order to arrive at the diagnosis for this question, one has to realize that this is a tachycardic rate on the EKG. So how do you calculate rate? I did not go over this before. You can either go with a methodology where you can uh, count the number of large squares between QRS complexes or between P waves, or you can count the number of small squares between QRS complexes or P waves. If you are counting the number of large squares between QRS complexes, you divide the number 300 by that large square and you will arrive at the rate. If you're counting uh, the number of small squares, which is more precise uh, between QRS complexes, you then divide the number 1500 by the number of small squares between QRS complexes. So if you take a look at the EKG that you were given, there are about nine small squares between <clears throat> two QRS complexes. So 1500 divided by 9 is about 166 beats per minute. So the EKG that were uh, shown uh, has a heart rate of about 166 beats per minute, uh, which is one of the questions that was asked, uh, showing that the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute. So that is the right answer. That is one of the right answers, which is heart rate more than 100 beats per minute. So you are given a narrow QRS complex tachycardia, which means it is a tachycardia with QRS complexes that are less than 120 milliseconds, and the rate is more than 100 beats per minute. When you have that to arrive at the diagnosis, you need to figure out if the QRS complexes occur at a regular interval or the QRS complexes are irregular. If the QRS complexes occur at irregular intervals, you need to figure out if there are visible P waves. If there are no visible P waves, then it is atrial fibrillation. If your QRS complexes occur at irregular intervals, but you see visible P waves be before most of the QRS complexes, then it is uh, either sinus tachycardia with premature atrial complexes, or atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter or multifocal atrial tachycardia. Uh, in this EKG that was given to you, uh, the QRS complexes occur at regular intervals, which means that all these options, if it was given to you, uh, were false. So it is not atrial fibrillation. Now atrial flutter can also be regular, so you need to go over that algorithm in a bit. Uh, but it is not multifocal atrial tachycardia, um, but um, this option was not given to you. So therefore, the EKG that was given to you was a regular narrow QRS complex tachycardia. So then we go to the next decision uh, point, which is whether it's a short RP or long RP tachycardia, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. When we talk about sinus rhythm, we look at the PR interval, which is this uh, distance between the P wave and the QRS complex. When we talk about narrow complex tachycardia, we talk about the RP interval, which is actually the distance between each QRS complex to the next P wave. So if the uh, distance between the QRS complex and the next P wave is short, what do we mean by short? If it is less than 70 milliseconds, 70, 70 milliseconds, we call that a short RP tachycardia. If the distance between each QRS complex and the next P wave is more than 70 milliseconds, we call that a long RP tachycardia. So short RP tachycardias where most of the time you are not even able to see a clear discernible P wave is either 
typical AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, a junctional tachycardia, or rarely it is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. If the distance is longer than 70 milliseconds, it's a long RP tachycardia, which are uh, mostly sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, or atypical AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. If you look at the EKG that you were given, the distance between each QRS complex and the next discrete P wave is more than 70 milliseconds, which means that um, this is a long RP tachycardia. So you, your choices are probably one of these. So atrial tachycardia was not given to you as a choice. A typical AV nodal reentrant tachycardia was not given to you as a choice. The only choice that was given to you is sinus tachycardia. So it's most probably sinus tachycardia, but uh, to decide between um, a long RP tachycardia, whether it's sinus tachycardia or atrial tachycardia, most often you have to look at whether the um, uh, tachycardia started abruptly and ended abruptly, which means it's atrial tachycardia, or did it start slowly, go up slowly and go down slowly, in which case it is sinus tachycardia. One of the other parameters that you can use to decide whether it's sinus tachycardia or atrial tachycardia is this relationship between, between age and maximal age predicted heart rate. So as you age, your maximal age predicted heart rate, which means the capability of your heart to mount a heart rate response goes down. Uh, so this relationship is usually calculated by the formula 220 minus age, 220 minus age. So if your tachycardic rate is more than the maximal age predicted heart rate, it cannot be sinus tachycardia. It most probably has to be atrial tachycardia. If it is within the range of the, the heart's ability to mount a tachycardic response, it could be sinus tachycardia or atrial tachycardia. So something to keep in the back of your mind. So clearly some of the choices that were given to you were wrong. It is not WPW because you do not see any delta waves on the EKG. Uh, the QRS complexes and the voltages do not meet any criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. And this is something that we've discussed in the prior uh, EKGs. And therefore, this is not a left ventricular hypertrophy. As we talked about before, remember that this narrow QRS complex tachycardia is regular. And therefore, this is not atrial fibrillation, which is irregular. Uh, and you can see clear P waves in this EKG um, as opposed to atrial fibrillation, where you cannot see any discernible P waves. So one of the answer choices that were given to you was atrial flutter. So why is it not atrial flutter? Number one, most atrial flutter uh, P waves are discrete and they are broad based. Like what do I mean by broad based? The P waves are much broader and they're undulating. Um, and so this is uh, lead V1, this is lead two. In both these leads, the P waves are broad based and they are like sawtooth pattern going up and down. But this is more typical of right-sided atrial flutters, right atrial flutters. When you go uh, to the whole uh, world of left atrial flutters, your P waves can be narrow based and can look like either uh, sinus P waves um, or like uh, long RP tachycardia P waves. So in those kinds of cases, how do you figure out if this is a left atrial flutter? The easiest way to figure out is to uh, look at the distance between two discernible P waves, which means that you know, you want to see if there is a P wave between two P waves that look like sinus P waves. So you measure the distance between those two and then um, you um, uh, divide that by two. So that distance by two and then you see if at that point in uh, the PP interval, you see another P wave that will then tell you that this is flutter. So as you can see, I measured the distance between two visible P waves and then divided that by two, which falls right about there in V1 and this is in lead two. And I don't see another bump that looks like a P wave and therefore there are no flutter waves in this EKG. So this is not atrial flutter.
another choice that was provided to you was atrial pacing. So atrial pacing, when you have a pacemaker in a patient, the pacing voltage or the current or energy that is being delivered by the pacemaker to uh, pace the atrium or ventricle is picked up by the ECG machine just like the voltage that is being generated by the heart itself. So the uh, pacing spikes as we call them are the uh, energy that is being delivered by the pacemaker which is being picked up by the ECG machine. If you have a dual chamber pacemaker where you have an atrial pacing followed by a ventricular pacing, you will see two spikes, one before the QRS complex and one before the P wave. If you have only atrial pacing uh, and there is no ventricular pacing, you will only see one spike that precedes the P wave. So in this case, the EKG that was given to you do not show any pacing spikes anywhere either before the QRS complex or before the P wave and therefore this is not atrial pacing. Another option that was given to you was junctional tachycardia. So what is junctional tachycardia? Junctional tachycardia is an automatic foci within the region of the AV node. So any automatic foci that is firing from within the region of the AV node is called junctional tachycardia. So the junctional tachycardia could be more atrial or more ventricular or within the AV node. So if it is more atrial, the depolarization from the atrial tachycardia is going to reach the atrium before it reaches the ventricle. And therefore, you will see an inverted P wave that falls before the QRS complex. It almost looks like the part of the QRS complex as you can see here in the second uh, electrogram that I am showing you. And the P waves are marked by the red arrow. So you can see an inverted P wave that falls before the QRS complex almost looks like a part of the QRS complex. This is because the no, uh, AV nodal or junctional tachycardia originates more on the atrial side, therefore it depolarizes the atrium before it depolarizes the ventricle. Now if your junctional tachycardia, the foci within the AV nodal region falls more on the ventricular side, then you will have a QRS complex followed by an inverted P wave. So there is atrial depolarization, which is this inverted P wave that follows ventricular depolarization, which is the QRS complex. And you can see here, I have shown you uh, what looks like an inverted T wave, but these are inverted P waves uh, that goes retrograde from the AV node back into the atrium. Um, so therefore, uh, although in the um, long RP, short RP uh, discrimination I showed you before, uh, junctional tachycardia is usually shown as a short RP tachycardia, which is this case here, because you can see here the P wave falls just after the QRS complex. It could also be long RP tachycardia in a foci that is more atrial in origin. So the distance between the QRS complex to the next P wave is could be long or short, but in both cases you will see a negative P wave in junctional tachycardia which you do not see in the EKG that was given to you and therefore it is not junctional tachycardia. One other option that was given to you was antidromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. So what is antidromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia? In patients with an accessory pathway, you can have reentrant tachycardias between the atrium and the ventricle. Uh, those tachycardias are called atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. Now, these reentrant tachycardias can either go from the atrium to the ventricle through the AV node and then go back from the ventricle back into the atrium through the accessory pathway and keep doing this circle over and over again. In this case, this tachycardia is called orthodromic AV node, AV reentrant tachycardia. So orthodromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia goes from the atrium to the ventricle through the AV node and back from the ventricle to the atrium through the accessory pathway. Because the anti-grade limb of the tachycardia, which means from the atrium to the ventricle, the movement on the depolarization is through the AV node and the normal conduction system, the tachycardia is narrow.
the narrow QRS tachycardia can be orthodromic reentrant tachycardia. Whereas in antidromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, the anti-grade limb, which means the depolarization uh, from the atrium to the ventricle, goes through the accessory pathway, and then the depolarization goes back from the ventricle into the atrium through the AV node. So, and therefore, in this case, because the anti-grade limb goes through no organized conduction system, you are going to have a wide QRS complex tachycardia, not a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. Therefore, the EKG that was given to you is not antidromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia because the tachycardia that was given to you was narrow QRS complex. Antidromic AV nodal AV reentrant tachycardia has to go through the accessory pathway from the atrium to the ventricle, and therefore, it is wide QRS complex. The last wrong choice that was given to you was this diagnosis called idiopathic left ventricular fascicular ventricular tachycardia. So what is this fascicular VT? Fascicular VT is a ventricular tachycardia that originates within the conduction system of the ventricle, within the his Purkinje system. Most often, this fascicular VT originates from the left fascicle, whether it's anterior or posterior. In both cases, fascicular VT is slightly wider than narrow QRS complex tachycardia. Among ventricular tachycardias, fascicular VT is the narrowest because it originates from within the conduction system and spreads through the ventricle within the conduction system. The QRS complexes are narrow in fascicular ventricular tachycardia but it's still wider than narrow QRS complex tachycardia. So it's usually between 100, um, uh, 110 to 140 milliseconds. The other discriminating factor is it always, always has a right bundle branch block morphology because these tachycardias originate from the right uh, sorry, from the left bundle, the left anterior or posterior fascicle, um, it always gives you a right bundle branch block like morphology, which is not the case in the tachycardia that you are given. It has a um, normal QRS complex. Um, if the tachycardia uh, originates from the uh, anterior fascicle, you will have a right axis deviation like in this uh, EKG. So this EKG that is uh, that I'm showing you has a right bundle branch block morphology with a right axis deviation. Therefore, this is an anterior fascicular uh, ventricular tachycardia. If on the other hand, if you have the same uh, feature, but you have a left axis deviation where this is upright and the inferior leads are negative, then it's a posterior fascicular ventricular tachycardia. So anyway, this EKG is not the one that was given to you because it does not have a right bundle branch block morphology, even though the QRS complexes are narrow. It is not idiopathic left ventricular fascicular VT. Therefore, the answer to the question that was given to you is sinus tachycardia. So uh, with this EKG, uh, we will see you again next week.